Hello everyone, welcome to the Kines 293 lecture. Today we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the educative nature of sport. And specifically, we're going to ask and answer the question, what does sport teach? Now, if I were to just ask this question regularly, people would say things such as teamwork or discipline or how to work together. All of those kind of cliches, but we're going to go a little bit deeper and talk about some of the more cultural and social things that sport has been structured to teach rather than inherently teach. Well, the popularity of sport may have been based upon the fact that they're fun to play or they promote health or anything like that. Below the surface, there's always an educative nature to sport, whether that's through growth or character or evolution. And physical cultural institutions have structured sport in these ways, whether implicitly or explicitly. And they often educate bodies to act in the proper ways, proper in quotes, because what we consider proper, or what people structuring sport historically have considered proper, was less about what is actually inherently proper and more about what the powerful thought was proper or the type of character that the powerful wanted to mold in order to, in some way, serve their interests. And so that's kind of what we're going to ask today, talk about the educative nature of sport. And the first thing we're going to do is talk about morality. And before we do this, we need to talk about the relationship between the mind and the body for what will make sense later. And it's something that throughout cultures and throughout time has always been kind of fluid. In ancient Greece, they saw the body as a symbol of divinity. They thought it was something that, as we've said ad nauseum by now, could honor the gods. Whereas a lot of early Christians believed that the body was inherently corrupt and the body was what made one prone to immoral activities. And this was based on the Cartesian ideal of a mind-body split, or dualism as it's called, whereas the mind is one entity and the body is another entity. Now, modern philosophers and scientists have more developed understandings now to where they know that the mind and the body are very much connected in more ways than we thought. But there was this pervasive idea that the mind was one thing and the body was another thing. And not only were they separate, but they had separate goals and separate aims as well. And during the medieval period, people thought that the mind was something um, to mold and to honor God with, whereas the body was the source of temptation. The body was the thing that led to sinning and all immoral behavior behavior it was a tool of the devil that could pervert the mind that could lead the mind astray and make the mind fall into temptation and so because they thought this a lot of early christians disciplined their bodies to make sure that there was no temptation or that it couldn't be prone to infecting the mind so to speak and so they denied it all pleasure, they kind of neglected their physical needs in order to make sure that their mind was their sole focus. And so following this logic, if the body is the root of all evil and this profane entity that um, could tempt people and, and corrupt the mind, then if the body is properly structured, then it could be trained to behave in ways that were socially acceptable or at least in line with the goals of society at that time, structured in ways that at least could be could make sure that they were least prone to falling into temptation. And the New England Puritans thought this way. They were reluctant to a lot of playful activities that pleased the body, and they made sure that whatever the body was doing had to have a purpose to serve God or at least serve some sort of contribution to society. They rejected all things regarding pleasure and fun and entertainment so they could focus their mind solely on 
what mattered to them, which was serving God. Now, of course, they did recognize that a couple of physical practices did have a purpose, such as um, target shooting would prepare one for military action, hunting and fishing, got food, walking promoted good health. But unless something had a specific purpose or a specific way that it pleased God, it wasn't worth doing. So that was up in New England, but in the South it was a little bit different, as a lot of things are. They viewed their body um, more as something that could be used for ends of entertainment and pleasure, and even something that you could make money off of. And this coalesced in the practice of rough and tumble fighting, which was popular during the 18th and 19th centuries, where basically two people would get together, usually drunk, but not always, and just fight each other, sometimes to the death. But what was common was eye gouging and biting off body parts and kicking, and it was a really rough, brutish affair. But a lot of people would place bets on these fights, and the person who won would get considerable money. And so there was also this um, idea that you can gain capital or gain status as, you know, the toughest guy in Alabama or something through fighting and through using your body. So in the North and South already, we get very different ideals regarding religion and the body and the mind. Regardless, as society develops and we start to get urbanization and cities popping up, we get a lot of young, unsupervised, mostly men that come from these rural areas into these cities. And now that a lot of people are living together in close proximity, there was a lot of social anxiety regarding public health and the morality of people who are, for the first time, mixing with people that did not grow up near them on the farm or close family friends. And it resulted in a sporting culture that a lot of people saw as immoral. And it was basically centered around taverns, theaters, brothels, firehouses, where there was a lot of fighting and a lot of um, immoral activity without much accountability. And this concerned a lot of people, rightfully or wrongfully. And although kind of the the idea that everything you did had to please God, uh, while well, that faded over time, a lot of the Puritans did have this idea that your actions needed to have some positive contribution. And it remained a powerful idea for people during this era. As Tom H Thomas Higginson wrote, physical health is a necessary condition for all permanent success. And he basically argued that the body can be used in a way to benefit God. And if physical activity is structured in a way that does so, the body will be best suited in order to fulfill those goals. So with this, we get the beginning and the foundation of a powerful movement called muscular Christianity. And this is something that started in the 1800s in England, where they recognized that physical education and how you adorn the body is important in developing moral character. This is what they thought. This wasn't a discovery that's a fact, but it's something that they took upon themselves and structured their physical cultural spaces to reflect. Specifically, we get Luther Gulick, who's the founder of the YMCA. He believed in this idea of muscular Christianity, which basically said that spiritual life relied on the equal development of body and mind. And so Gulick was a big Christian, somebody that was ascetic and very devoted to finding ways to please God. And in contrast to the thinking that what you did with your body didn't matter as long as your mind was focused on God, he thought that the body in itself can be used to serve God. And that in order to develop your moral character that's in the mind and your spiritual character that's in the mind, you also needed to develop your physical body in healthy ways. So to serve your body, to improve it, to become healthier, to become stronger, was to 
become a better Christian because it's something that God would look upon fondly. And this idea of muscular Christianity was a powerful influencer in how a lot of physical cultural spaces were structured. Now, I wanted to backtrack a little bit and bring back up um, a type of power that we haven't really talked about yet. Remember that power is the central focus of this course. And at the start of the course, we brought up disciplinary power. And it's a little bit different than political power, economic power, hegemonic power, things of that sort. No, rather disciplinary power, kind of theorized by the French philosopher Michel Foucault, he basically said that power isn't always top-down coercion. It's not always somebody else making you do something. Rather, it's that people are taught social expectations about themselves and their bodies and are trained to meet them. Trained by others, in some cases, yes, but he said that as long as people are taught expectations, social expectations about the ideal way to act in a society or what's considered the ideal, they'll train themselves to meet that. Therefore, they're making themselves acquiesce to a certain social ideal. And rather than being forced to comply with this ideal, they internalize it and regulate their own behavior. Now keep this in mind as we talk about physical culture and muscular Christianity. So, following Gulick and this muscular Christianity thinking, a lot of reformers believed that sport and physical activity could be a viable or at least Christian alternative to the tavern culture that had arose in many of the cities at this time that a lot of people, or people in power I should say, saw as immoral. They thought that sport and physical activity could be a vehicle for building the character that they viewed as ideal, which is a character that glorified God. And because of this, we see them kind of create their physical cultural spaces in a way that taught boys certain messages on how to behave. It taught them the ideals, specifically the ideal man, who was someone that behaved properly, in quotes again, um, showed sportsmanship, showed deference and respect for authority, basically using sport as a way to create these characters that they viewed as moral. Ultimately hoping that in the process, and definitely in the end, it will serve God. And so this is what we get with a lot of the major organizations, such as the YMCA, which is literally the Young Men's Christian Association. They were based in the thinking of muscular Christianity and weren't necessarily about sports at all at their beginning. Rather, they were these spiritual organizations and they used sport as a way to attract young boys, to give them something to recruit them into their organizations and in their buildings and let them play sport. And then in the end, through sort of a Trojan horse, they would be taught these spiritual cultural, social lessons, and they would be turned into good, quote-unquote, Christian young men. In fact, with the YMCA, physical activity wasn't an emphasis at all at first. They thought that um, it was a distraction from God, but they realized that, like I was talking about, it could be used to glorify God. The leaders recognized at the beginning that it was neither sport itself nor the focus of the body that was sinful, but the activities and spaces typically associated with sport that were degrading. And in here he's talking about um, the rough and tumble fighting. Boxing is a big sport at this time. Anything kind of in um, the urban culture that was seen as immoral, football included. But of course with these organizations, it wasn't enough to just have sport. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't willingly go into these organizations because they could play sport anywhere. But rather, you had to create this culture in which Christian values and this kind of muscular Christian thinking was entrenched from boyhood. And and here's where we get um, sports fiction, where a lot of the heroes written in sports literature espouse this muscular Christianity thinking. The characters were quote-unquote moral actors. 
They didn't smoke, they didn't drink or cheat, they protected the weak, worked hard, exhibited behavior, and because of it were successful and served God. And because a lot of boys grew up reading this, they thought that that's the best way to play sports, that sport is something you could do that inherently should glorify God. Of course, this wasn't the case. A lot of the athletes weren't these um, perfect little altar boys. They drank, they smoked, they cheated, they gambled. Nonetheless, the literature kind of worked to institute this culture, which would get people to internalize these ideals of how to act morally. I mean, Babe Ruth, who was kind of the biggest athlete in the world during this era that everyone looked up to, was kind of notorious for that picture with always a smoke in his hand and drinking before his games and womanizing and all those things. Nonetheless, it serves as an example about how physical culture has been used to create this ideal morality and that it was influential in reproducing these specifically in young boys. And it's not that sport itself, of course, was inherently moral or inherently conducive to producing one certain kind of morality that people in power thought was the best morality, but rather it was socially constructed by those people to be structured in that way to promote a type of character development that served their ideal image of a society. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how sport has been used rather um, than educating morality to educate productivity within capitalist America. And so kind of ask yourself the question, what attributes do you need to be a successful athlete? In fact, if you're listening right now, I want you to stop and write down five attributes that you need to be a successful athlete, or at least five attributes that sports have taught you or you've been told are necessary for being a successful athlete. Just five. And I'll tell you what, for extra credit, email me those five that you um, came up with, and I'll give you a point of extra credit on your discussion post. But write down those five real quick. Okay, hopefully you wrote those down. Now I want to ask a second question. What attributes do you need to be a successful worker? If you look at the attributes that you wrote down, chances are all five of them will correspond. That all five that you wrote down for being a successful athlete will translate to being a successful worker. And hopefully you'll ask yourself, hmm, what's the reason for that? Is that a coincidence? Well, that's what we're going to talk about now. Stay tuned. Okay. So a little context before we move on. The Industrial Revolution and the onset of capitalism it changed society in a lot of ways, but one of the ways is that it shaped life to work around um, the factory life. As a lot of people got jobs, the totality of their lives started to revolve around that job. And while this happened in agrarian economies as well with agriculture, for the first time, industrialization prompted this to happen with manufacturing and factories and kind of a hierarchical workforce instead of just your individual agriculture. And soon after, we get the development of Fordism, which is essentially what Henry Ford, the creator of Ford Motors, used to create his cars. It was basically the modern assembly line approach in which workers had basically one skill, and they would repeat that job over and over and over and over again every day until they retired or died or a war popped off or something. But essentially this was more efficient um, as people learned one skill and became good at it and just did that over and over 
and went down this assembly line. And it created this kind of mass-produced society where products were standardized. They were all the same thing. As Henry Ford said, you can have any color car you like as long as it's black. And it created this mass consumption society as well where people were consuming these standardized products and therefore had the same things. So this drastically changed um, how work was done. Similarly to Fordism was this idea of Taylorism, which was um, a set of scientific studies that used time and motion um, to find ways to make workers more efficient. Basically paid for by bosses to try to figure out how can I make my workers make more money for me, maximize their efficiency, and produce more things, usually while not compensating them for that increased production usually while keeping their conversation the same. But nonetheless, Taylorism is, it, it looked at a whole bunch of things such as the lighting, do our workers more efficient in this lighting versus that lighting, or the temperature, are they more productive at 72 degrees rather than 71 degrees? Everything to try to improve efficiency. And so in a lot of in a lot of ways, the industrial workers became these parts of machines that they worked on. And because they had such a standardized job, it was in the corporation's interests to have their employees be sober, disciplined, focused, um, team-oriented, respective of authority, and of course, competitive. Now, if you look at those attributes, you'll probably notice that the same applies to sport. Sober, eh, probably the most controversial out of these, but it probably helps to be sober playing your sport. And of course, it helps to be disciplined, focused, team-oriented, respective of authority, and competitive. And so one thing, interesting thing about capitalism is that it doesn't end once you clock out. Capitalism and, and people in the interest of capital have always attempted to extend their control beyond the workplace when they go home to make sure that the ideal worker is being molded even when he or she is not at work. And this was one of the ways that physical culture was used. So for workers, or, or I'm sorry, for business owners and capitalists, it wasn't in their interest to have their workers doing these things that they saw as immoral, this working class culture, such as going out and getting drunk every night, rough and tumble fighting, um, going to brothels, doing anything that, that basically wasn't making them a better worker. So instead, they thought that physical activities and sport could be used as a healthy alternative to this working class culture. So kind of like the first part of this lecture, capitalists used physical culture and even financed a lot of organizations and teams and, you know, created the um, softball leagues and even football leagues for after work in a way to make sure that their workers beyond the workplace were being instilled with discipline and propriety and self-restraint and a lot of things that would help them become good workers. And football makes the perfect example of this process. And so as Walter Camp said, one of the biggest founding fathers of football, American business has found in American college football the epitomization of present day business methods. Football has come to be recognized as the best school for instilling into the young man those attributes which business desires and demands. Here we have another quote talking about how well the attributes of football align with the attributes of the corporate workplace. In football, on each play, 11 men act in unison, and in each action, not the individual, but the corporate unit acts. When Bart Starr completed a pass for the Green Bay Packers, all the Packers could be said to share the deed. One man alone is quite helpless. However, with baseball, when Joe DiMaggio stepped to the plate in Yankee Stadium with his unforgettable stance and fluid swing, DiMaggio stood in spotlighted solitude, and none of his teammates could act in his behalf. Football is corporate, baseball an association of individuals. And because of this, 
it's no coincidence that football rose at the time when corporate America rose. But Camp did far more than win football games. He was the first to systematize the new sport by instituting organized practices and bringing order to a gridiron more often the scene of bloody anarchy. Coaches, or captains as they were called, received no salary for their work. Camp's full-time job was as an executive at a clock company, which had much to do with how the sport evolved. Football's development often mirrored what was going on in American society at the close of the 19th century. It's important to remember that Walter Camp was not just associated with Yale's football program. He was associated with the New Haven Clock Company. Football is the first American sport governed by a clock. And the clock itself was the very symbol of modernity, chopping the day up into ever smaller entities, efficiency, time and motion studies, America gearing up to be an industrial powerhouse. And Walter Camp said football will be the ideal training program for America's managerial elites. He's an amazing person. He wrote 30 books on sports. He had well over 200 articles that were written in magazines. He wrote newspaper articles. He was unbelievable promoter of college football and one of its first commercializers. As so, was Walter Camp interested in football? Probably. He probably loved the game, but his interests extended beyond football for its own sake. He used it and structured it as a way to create corporate workers. And so here we can see how physical culture is structured by people in power to serve their own interests in many ways. And not only does football educate for the corporation, but a lot of scholars point out how football also is education for military life. While football utilizes um, a lot of the same language, um, the whole point of football is to conquer space, right? You need to take from the opponent and you need to get in the end zone as your goal. And it also has a hierarchical organization and tactics that are very much indicative of the military. Whereas um, the player answers to the assistant coach who answers to the coach who answers to the GM who answers to the owner and so on and so on just like in the corporate workplace and just like in the military. In fact, in World War II, more than 150 admirals and generals played college football and took a lot of those same lessons and applied them to the war. So that's just football, but do any other sports or physical activities play an educative role? I think we can think of a lot of them, um, but for the sake of time, I'll leave that for you to ponder. So we talked about sport and physical activity being used to educate morality and to be educate product and to educate productivity, but it also, in a lot of ways, has educated people on how to consume the other end that capitalism relies on. And this story starts in the fifties. So after the war, we get New Deal policies that are putting money in regular working class people's pockets. We have the baby boom. We have the post-war economy that creates this period of unprecedented growth where people are making money and society is thriving. And with this, as we've talked about before, we get um, the nuclear family that consists of the breadwinning father, male, and the stay-at-home wife and the kids, right? But there was this fear that with the processes of suburbanization that these families were drifting apart now that men were working in the city and women were staying at home. And in the same era, we have what we call the organization man, who's no longer this um, Fordist, Taylorist, industrial factory worker, but increasingly becoming the madman-esque white-collar professional who has a role in large bureaucratic corporations and is seen as 
the breadwinner, whereas that was the male ideal at this time. The female ideal was a return from working in the war, going back into the house, into the private domestic sphere, sphere where the husband was still the authority and the wife took care of the house. This, these were the gender roles at that time. And in this context, we get the founding of Little League. So it started in 1939, but um, it really blew up after the war as um, by the 50s, by the late 50s, there was almost 22,000 teams established across the nation. And like the Carrier article talks about, a lot of Little League's growth was due to this anxiety over family structure and juvenile delinquency and economic changes. Whereas they viewed Little League as the antidote to this nuclear family that was drifting apart because it would bring the family back together in ways that we'll talk about in a second. But also there was this idea that the kids these days are just criminals and they're tearing society apart. A common theme that basically every generation says, but juvenile, juvenile delinquency um, was apparently on the rise and they thought that Little League would be an alternative to that. And also economic change, and specifically the shift to a consumer economy. So we'll go through those in a second. But Little League, in, in a lot of youth sport, was educated in ways to teach young boys how to be proper um, men within this changing economy. So it taught them how to obey authority and accept their place within a hierarchy to subjugate themselves to the good of the group, have good work habits, and to be competitive, which is um, a, a primary tenet of individualist capitalism. And besides instilling young boys with values that were considered to be proper, it also reinforced gender roles that people viewed as keeping the family together, probably wrongfully. But they viewed that Little League was a way to um, show young boys that their fathers were in control and have women go back to playing the background roles. And as we can see with a lot of Little League still today, it's the father is the coach and the mother is the one who is um, on the bench or making oranges for the team or hosting these team outings. Essentially, it showed that the gender hierarchy um, would still be in place, that the fathers were the authority figures with the mothers in the background, teaching the ideal, quote-unquote, family structure. And as the Carrier article talks about, Little League Baseball was also educative of productivity as um, it had regularly scheduled practices that taught boys how to be places on time, assigned positions that taught people how to specialize in a certain skill, uniforms, and it prepared boys to fit into this new corporate white-collar society. But in addition to that, it also taught them how to consume. Now, literally, it created a market for sporting goods that for the first time was aimed at children. Now, a lot of marketing and advertising, which was on the growth um, during this era, almost all of it was targeted at adults. People viewed it as kind of stupid to market to kids because, of course, kids aren't the ones that have the money or the purchasing power or even our understanding of a lot of the ads. But Little League was kind of the advent of marketing to young children. Essentially, what they did was on kids' television stations or magazines or newspapers, they would have all these ads aimed at young boys to show them kind of the ideal things to have for Little League. So anyone who's played Little League know that knows that it was always... Uh, the one kid who had the best batting gloves and the newest bats and the custom-made helmet and all these different gadgets. that They were seen as these idols of consumption. But essentially what happens is they realize that although 
young kids don't have money and purchasing power, they will tug at their mom's purse and beg until they get what they want, until they get that new bat or those new gloves or whatever. So Little League was kind of the advent of kids becoming consumers. And not only was it that um, they consumed these goods for playing Little League itself, but more importantly, it was that it taught them how to be consumers when they were adults for a new economy and society that was founded around consumption as the main driver of the economy, an economy that relied on people buying things that mostly they don't need. So in conclusion, we talked about how sport educates people in a lot of different ways, about morality, about productivity, about consumption, and a lot of people think that sport has these inherent qualities that just tend to do that and they just pass along to anyone who plays them. Well, I'm taking the opposite position. I'm saying that nothing in sports, since we created sport, nothing is really inherent to it. Rather, it's how we structure it in which we get these values that arise in sport. And because certain people structure it, certain people in power, it's important to understand how that structure corresponds with the goals of the people that are structuring it and how it benefits their interests. Thank you.